Yeah, no, I'm absolutely not going to do this intro in English. I'm sorry. If you want to listen to my special zombie episode intro, go to the German version and suffer through the first 20 seconds and then come back. It really hurt my throat and I'm absolutely not going to do this again. I'm really sorry. Maybe, I guess. <coughs> okay, so... Hello and welcome to the very first English episode of the Corvus Corax podcast. The topic of today is the zombie, especially in the context of philosophy. And yes, uh, first uh, let me introduce myself a bit. I'm a German podcast host. I've been doing podcasts for about a year now i've been doing videos on youtube generally for seven years now and my wife has been bugging me to do these podcasts in english too because she thinks my english is quite good and i think she's making a great mistake uh, in her judgment there but i guess i've decided to do this anyways so yeah there we are okay so uh There's a tradition in the German version of the podcast where I tell you what I drink and the drink that I drink, the beverage, has to be a different one every episode. If there's any sponsor out there, this is the only sponsorship I'd accept. Beverages. Uh, today I'm drinking a wild berry tea. I don't know if you translate it that way. It's... A tea I got from my local tea shop. Anyways, so, okay, <laughs> zombies, what's up with that? Uh, first, let us take a look at the history of the modern image of the zombie. One can find the origin of the image of the zombie when one takes a look at the American military occupation of Haiti uh, from 1915 to 1934. There a legend was uh, persisting through these few strange decades that voodoo magicians were able to resurrect a body and make it work endlessly. You have to imagine the zombie happy, as Camus probably used to say in an alternate universe, I guess. As the news of this legend reached America, the interest in it was growing rapidly in its popular culture. This specifically occult image of the zombie rots away and dissolves at a certain point in the 1970s, which can be traced to the release of a certain movie, George A. Romero's 1968 released movie Night of the Living Dead, in which the word zombie ironically never appeared, not even once. Following the discussions of the last few decades in the philosophy of mind, one will be aware of the fact that the zombie even creeped in here through David Chalmers' influential essay. When it comes to the philosophical zombie, it is usually, uh, usually about the critique of physicalism and or functionalism. At the center of this criticism lies the term qualia. Qualia means something like how it is, that is, a qualitative uh, experience. The functionalist tries to reduce human consciousness to a number of functions. Uh, take as an example a beverage machine. You throw a coin into the machine, this changes its internal status from X1 to X2, and it, co and it res responds according to the input, which has influenced its internal status. How and what exactly happens with this internal status, and how it is for the beverage machine, does not matter, since the entire work of the machine is described by its function. Whether gears are working or a fairy uses its magic in the interior, which set the machine in motion, does not really matter, as long as the machine reacts accordingly. The same should also be the case with consciousness, only more complex. We get an input, Our internal state changes accordingly, and we give a response corresponding to our new internal state. 
an output determined by the state. Here comes the critique, uh, criticism of the philosophical zombie. If functionalism is true, then the qualitative experience would have to be irrelevant for the, for the function. <coughs> Sorry, to the function. Accordingly, philosophical zombies would have to be conceivable. Of course, my expl explanation is not but a pure caricature, and we should actually be discussing possible worlds and the meaning of conceivability in a metaphysical or even ontological context and so on and so forth, but I just wanted to utilize this thought experiment to establish the following assumption. Consciousness sets us humans apart from zombies. Of course, this assumption is extremely problematic, because we do not know exactly how to handle it. How do I know now that my counterpart is not a philosophical zombie? If the output of his function process are similar or alike the genuine, genuinely human one, how could I tell them apart? Here the zombie of popular culture can help us, for in stories which are about the fact that someone is in the process of transformation into a zombie, a special aspect of zombieing is highlighted. Zombieing is expressed by an increasing loss of self-control. For this reason, there are some zombie movies or books or games in which a character from a romantic couple becomes a zombie and wants to die rather than survive death and kill the partner as a will-liberated zombieing. They don't want to turn into an ungetüm, as one might say. This also clarifies why being undead is something bad for the living. However, the question is not answered whether being undead is bad in itself for the undead. Let's take a look at why death is considered bad. Because it's the step in between. One of the most common strategies in this regard is a desire frustration theory. We rate, we rate the rejection of something wanted as bad. And because death frustrates our desires in general, it's something that we should work our way around. However, this is not a good argument as to why it is bad for the zombie to be undead. It may even be that he as a, uh, has a craving for human flesh and brain, and the satisfaction of this, in the sense even speaks for the undead being, for the zombie being. It's an argument for his existence in this specific mode. If we are already on this hedonistic utilitarian ground, we could paraphrase John Stuart Mill here and say that it is better to be a corpse than a satisfied undead, since his cravings are of a very low quality and the zombie is not in the condition to perform higher quality cognitive operations. Here comes an example to mind which Zizek uses to explain his understanding of dialectics. The dialectic movement of Zizek takes place through the negation of the negation, which reflects the synthesis. However, according to Zizek, the negation of the negation is not a return to the thesis, not a minus a minus equals plus, but the break with the meaning-giving framework which makes the tension between thesis and an antithesis possible in the first place. His example is to understand living as the thesis and death as the antithesis, whereupon the negation of the negation follows in the undead. The zombie is not alive nor dead, he negates the meaning-giving framework. Here, however, I would like to draw attention to a weak spot that struck me while reading Hartwig Schmidt's work on uh, Nichts und Zeit, in English nothingness and time. Zizek's negation of the negation is really just a pejoration of the negation. Pejoration is the meaning of the prefix un. For example, if we say that a person is, and I now have to use a different word, uh, inhumane, in German it's unmenschlich, then we do not doubt his material constitution descriptively, but say that there is a norm that belongs to the concept of humanity and that this norm has been broken. Pejoration is the breach of or an underlying norm. In the case of the undead, it is his 
unrestrained instinctual drive, his lack of awareness and his lack of socio-sexuality that makes up the core of this subversive tendency. If an undead stood in front of a person who was able to enter into an intimate relationship with people who had consciousness and could control his instincts, then he would lose his rank as an undead in the consciousness of the person. Well, maybe except for his looks, that might be a distracting factor, I guess. That's actually why this look is used a lot in Hollywood movies. How would you distinguish between complex human-like zombies and humans if it weren't for this look, you zombie-phobe? To break it down perhaps a little differently, what distinguishes a person from a zombie cannot be determined on one level by a single ism. Functionalistic, phenomenological and behavioristic observations are needed to clearly state the difference between human and zombie. <coughs> Here we also arrive at a problem of the debate around the philosophical zombie. The question of whether we can imagine a philosophical zombie is based on an impossibility, for to imagine what it is like to be a consciousness-free body is not possible because, or, or due to the a priori necessity of consciousness for this mental act. Furthermore, these debates often ignore the fact that self-being and social identity are related. Absolute Antisocial self-being is unthinkable from birth onwards due to the inevitable interdependence of human life. Furthermore, the self needs to be aware of an other and the social context to create an identity, at least in the psychoanalytical and sociologi sociological sense. Now, one of the main characters, or a person who is important to the protagonist, becomes a zombie. Now, as Lenin would have put it, what is to be done? Often the solution is kill the zombie. Even if it takes a lot of emotional work to be able to do so, just get rid of him. But why is it still easier for us to kill a zombie than a human? Here I'd like to discuss the question of the value of a zombie. What could be the central factor of zombieing that makes it less valuable relative to humans? Is it the terrible acts that it commits? For some, yes, but for most, no. Most are against the death penalty, even in cases of serious crimes. It is, the absence, is it the absence or severe limitation of the zombie's mental performance? For some, yes, but for most, no. Most people would not consider the murder of someone who has lost their consciousness, who has a mental disability, or the like, to be morally defensible. Incidentally, this is an argument often made in the vegan debate. So, why kill zombies? Maybe you should ask, ask yourself why he does not or should kill zombies, I don't know. Maybe it's changing the identity of the person, the emergence of a different identity. Perhaps we justify it by either no longer being obliged to the previous identity in the sense of a contract theory, or else we are acting out of an obligation to the pre-zombie identity of the person. Both things could be a possibility, but is it really a different identity we're talking about? We assume that the zombie's brain no longer works as before, but how much of the brain must stop functioning, or functioning in the same way as before, before we speak of another person? If, like at the end of Shaun of the Dead, we somehow get the murderer's tendencies under control, isn't it still the same person we're playing video games with? To go the way through the brain death criterion to declare the undead as dead is one possibility, but the undead breaks the life-death dichotomy by his actions, which is why this attempt would be utterly futile. So in order to propose an understanding of the self, which knows no hard limits, but allows more transitions and blurring, we abandon the essential, essentialist approach and see the self as some kind of fiction. With, with Hume and Parfit, we can understand the self as the existence of a psychological continuity. 
To put it in a nutshell, if there will be one future person who will have enough of my brain to be psychologically continuous with me, that person would be me. As Parfit writes, Imagine being decomposed at a teleporter to your atoms and reconstructed at the other end. Then one actually died, but is not dead, since the reconstruction possesses the psychological continuity of the previous self. If we approach the matter from this framework, then we can say that regardless of the state of the brain, the zombies are not identical to their previous self, since they're purpose in life has fundamentally changed. At least in most cases, there certainly are humans that like to eat human meat, and they can be fairly nice, I guess, at least according to Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Anyways, their purpose in life has changed because their lives are now limited, uh, aimed at the goal of eating human flesh. That's the limit of it. However, we encounter problems here as well. For example, what about a situation in which someone was indoctrinated by some sect and now thinks he's reborn? Do we lose our previous duties to this person? For example, don't we still owe him any money? So, if I owe someone money, should I just send him to some kind of church and let him indoctrinate, be indoctrinated and then I don't owe him any money anymore? This realization seems rather bizarre. A look at Shaun of the Dead may help us here again. In our everyday lives, we perform some actions as in an automatism. In these situations, functionalism seems to succeed. However, it is our ability to plan for the future and to consciously adapt our actions accordingly, the brief moments of everyday clarity that distinguish us from the zombie. If we look at Sean, then, for the first time in a long time, he had made the decision for the future and forged a plan. First, they go and drive. Uh, first, they go and no, yes, yes. First, they go to his mother's house and pick them up, take care of the zombified father, stepfather, uh, drive to his ex-girlfriend's house and drink tea at hers. The second plan, because the story progresses and things don't go exactly how they would like it to be, is to drive to the house of the mother, take care of the zombified stepfather, pick up the axe and drive back to his place for a cup of tea. And the third plan was to drive to the mother's house, get the mother, take the stepfather down, get the axe and go to the pub and drink until it's all over, which seems to be the best plan of all three. At the end of the movie, Sean's girlfriend says, in reference to the fact that he was not uh, that it was not the plan itself and his choice of what to do that was important, but that he had even made a decision and tried to make it a reality. And this might be something that some people who are interested in politics should take a look at. At least around here in Germany. One might... Uh, Think of Jean-Paul Sartre's concept of transcendence, which lies at the core of human freedom, at least for him. What makes man free is his ability to think of oneself in the future, that is to transcend, to act on this image of the future. Even if we accept the factor of transcendence, we have not covered every form of zombie. However, it should be clear how stimulating thinking about zombies can be. In the end, I cannot tell you how you should act toward a zombie. Self-defense is probably okay, I guess. I don't even have a th I have my own theory of personality that could satisfy me, especially the diversity of the zombie makes it all the more difficult. Here I would like to quote John Gibson. Here's a list, very incomplete, of things one should keep in mind when attempting to write seriously about zombies. Zombies do not exist. Zombies are not related to werewolves or vampires. Zombies are not, literally, mindless consumers, enraged proletarians or stupid Americans, although some were probably once these things, and there is little use in casting them, even metaphorically, as essentially such, especially when attempting to offer a theory of zombies. This is because zombies do not form a natural kind, not even a fictional natural kind. 
Within the genre, zombies are zombies vary greatly in behavior, cognitive power and athletic ability. Some shamble, some run at or near Olympic speeds. Some are incapable of manipulating even simple objects, others play video games with erstwhile friends, some behave better, at least not worse than the living, others are Nazis. Some are created by ill-advised government programs, others by hearing Canadian English. All of this makes it difficult, and likely a colossal waste of time, to make grand general pronouncements on the nature of the living dead, the interest they hold for us, or their basic cultural significance, which is just as well, since I do not have a theory of zombies. In fact, my claim is that zombies can offer a particular kind of philosophical and aesthetic reward precisely when we do not know just what they are, what animates them, or what it amounts to when we get to work killing them, self-defense notwithstanding. One could end this episode here, but I'm not finished yet. Of course, the zombie also has a political meaning. In some zombie movies, series and games, children and adolescents also live in the zombified world. They cannot imagine a world that would be worth recreating, since they grew up in the zombified world. And I think we can glean some interesting insights into today's political situation from Peter Sloterdijk's critique of cynical reason and Slava Zizek's sublime object. For these children, the desire of adults to reclaim a world that is worthy of being recreated with their ancient traditions, their understanding of family, work, etc. is a pure ideology. One of Sloterdijk's key ideas is that it has to get better before something sensitive can be learned. The consequence of this is that our learning today is not designed to solve the problems of the future. It rather creates them. In both Zizek's pure ideology and Sloterdijk's false consciousness of the Enlightenment, we find a light motive. The previous tries to reproduce in a world that exposes the past as a sham, resulting in the generation zombie, for whom this quasi-utopian world loses all credibility. This aimlessness provides the breeding ground for a world in which everyone becomes a zombie more and more without wanting to, but also without a way out. The end of history is the beginning of the zombified world. It's not so much the often vilified social media that turns people into zombies, it is much more the participation in the ideological carnival and the neoliberal straitjacket of the bourgeois, who seeks protection in an unreflected illusory centrism and dives into his supposedly apolitical everyday life. So, what do I really want to say in the end of it all? I don't know, watch Shaun of the Dead, I guess. It's a, it's an entertaining movie. I'll probably watch it too. Maybe don't kill zombies? Talk to them first, I don't know. Throw them into a gulag? Make them useful? Pfft. As if I have all the answers. That's not my job, I'm just a voice. Okay, so that was the first English episode of the podcast, depending on the reaction I get, I'll continue to producing this podcast in German and English. If there's no interest at all in it, well, that's it, I guess. So if you are interested in me continuing this podcast in English, then give me some feedback wherever you listen to this, Spotify, YouTube, I don't know. Anchor, Google Podcast. Anyways, have a nice time interval, I guess. <laughs>